When you don't understand the concept of prayer, you just pray because you were asked to pray. But when you know what prayer is, you will pray with a definite understanding of what your prayers can produce. There are a lot of believers that pray, they just pray. They said we should pray. They ask us to come for a prayer meeting. So they just pray, but they are not really praying with understanding of what prayer is, and they are not praying with expectations. Tonight, as we pray, somebody will experience the workings of prayer. Prevailing in the place of prayers. What does that mean, to prevail in the place of prayer? It means... A victorious ask, outcome or experience by the hand and the help of God from the place of prayers. The victorious outcome you get by the hand and the help of God because you prayed. The outcome of victory the outcome of testimony that becomes a reality in your life because you prayed. And by your prayer, you secure the hand and the help of God. As believers, we are not victims. The outcome of your life as a believer should be that of the hand and the help of God. That is, men should be able to see that the hand of God is at work in your life and his help is evident for all to see. That you are not just an ordinary person, but the person who enjoys the hand of God and receives the help of God. And someone you will experience that in this service in Jesus name. Amen. For you and I to experience the hand of God and the help of God. We have to find a time to always pray. We, we should be a people who are prayerful so that we can have the outcome of what the hand and the help of God can produce. In Exodus 17, 10 to 13, we are told that there was war between the Israelite and the Amalekite. And Joshua, at that time, was the one with the responsibility to lead the Israelite on that battle. And the scripture said, let's read it together. Exodus 17, 10 to 13, the easy to read version. It says, Joshua obeyed Moses and went to find the Amalekites the next day. At the next day, to find the Amalekite the next day. And then what? At the same time, Joshua, please listen to this. Joshua obeyed Moses uh, by the reason of the instruction given to him by Moses. Go lead the armies of Israel. Go and find the Amalekite, the, the enemies of the Israelite. Uh, and the Bible said, at the time that Joshua was leading that war front, Moses, Aaron, and Hur. They didn't go to the battlefield, but they had to fight the battle from another angle. Lift up your two hands. In the name of Jesus, I don't know what battle you are fighting physically. Receive the grace to also approach you spiritually. Please stay with me. Please stay with me. If you have an understanding of what this is, it will change your life. It will change the narrative of your life. Joshua was to lead a team of people to fight the battle physically, then Moses, Aaron, and Hur, they are to fight from the spiritual angle. If you got what I said, say amen. amen. 
Now, they were going to fight against the Amalekites. Like Stay with me this evening. But they understood that we wrestle not against flesh and what? And blood. Just as it was in the days of David engaging in a battle with Goliath, we saw that the battle between David and Goliath wasn't just a physical battle alone because the scripture told us that when Goliath showed David, he placed a curse with his gods on David. That reveals to us that even though uh, Goliath was a man of great size, he was called a giant, there was another dimension of his ability to defeat his opponent that is spiritual. So he cursed David. That is a spiritual dimension. If David had not known God and understood spiritual things, he would have been a victim to Goliath, not necessarily because of the size of Goliath, but Goliath connection with the spirit of powers that backs him. Lift up your two hands. Never again will you be a victim. Are you with me? There are a lot of believers who are victims because they do not have understanding of how spiritual things work. Now, we've seen here this evening, praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Joshua leading the people to fight against the Amalite, Amalekite. But then, there is another dimension of that battle which has to be led by Moses, Aaron, and Hall. And that is the spiritual dimension. I need you to open your ears this evening and hear what I have to say. If you are going to experience an outcome of victory, breakthrough, glory, greatness, fulfillment of your destiny, you must have an understanding of how to approach whatever you do, both from the spiritual angle and from what? The physical angle. You are about to set up a business. You have the money. That is okay. But beyond you having the money, having a good plan, you need to introduce the spiritual dimension. Because you can have a, 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 a good business plan and you have a lot of money, yet you began the business and the business failed. You have all the connections. You have all your facts put together, yet you are not making progress because you have neglected or you are ignorant of the spiritual dimension required for you to secure the hand and the help of God in order for your business to do well. I saw there are a lot of believers who are victims because they do not recognize that in fighting against our common enemy, the devil, you need, you need to approach it both with the physical approach and the spiritual approach. As a matter of fact, the spiritual approach should be another grand work. If you are still here, say amen. amen. There are believers who are just carried away. The Bible says, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. How are they carried away? You know, someone has proposed to you. You show the ring. You tell everybody. Yet the marriage is not holding. Years after. And suddenly the person changes his mind. How do you think the person is evil? We wrestle not against flesh and what? And blood. But against principalities and pirates. So, in, in Exodus 17, 10 to 13, I'm going to read and please stay with me. He said, Joshua obeyed Moses and went to fight who? The Amalekite the next day. And the Bible then said, at that same time, Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill to fight from that angle. You are a believer. You do not know that we are against an enemy who is spiritual. If we are going to conquer, if we are going to prevail, 
we must have the understanding on how to engage in a battle that has two dimensions, both the physical and the spiritual, by knowing what we should do and doing it and also going before God to secure his hand and his help so that he can do what we cannot do. When you have this understanding, you will live a balanced life. You will live a forfeit life. Because you will have the hand and the help of God to your advantage. Mm. Someone who believes you say amen. amen. Moses and Aaron and Hall took their position also in the battle against the Amalekites. They know that the Amalekites are not ordinary people. They believe in their gods. They believe in their magical power. And so they may have cast a spear. They may have done some demonic activities against the Israelites. So Moses said, Joshua, you lead the physical battle. I, her, and Aaron, we will fight it from the spiritual angle. You are about to write as I am. You stored it very well. You've done everything. You've gotten all your facts right and you are so excited. The few hours to the exam, you caught fever. Few hours to the exam, something strange happened to you. The reason why that may have happened is because you, you rely on your uh, uh, ability to assimilate. You've studied very well. You have everything together and you told yourself this is all I needed. You do not realize that why Joshua is leading the armies of Israel to fight physically. Aaron, Moses and Hor took the spiritual aspect of the battle. Don't forget the Bible says, says the race is not for the swift. The race is not for the swift. It's Bible told us to be carnally minded is dead. There are too many carnally minded church people. You are beautiful, very beautiful. Proverbs says, I've seen the beautiful ones not marrying, and I've seen the ones they call not beautiful getting married. What is the secret? Because the beautiful one says, I am too fine to be ignored. I'm too beautiful not to have someone to seek my hand. You are not aware that outwardly you are beautiful, but spiritually there is a mask on your life. There is something they are saying that is not true about you, that even you are not aware of, and that is why they seek your hand today, tomorrow they say no. They look at you, you think they should see an attractive you, but there is an, an aspect of you that they are saying that you are not aware of. There is a mask, there is something that reveals to them that make them perceive you as an evil person. Lift up your two hands today. I declare that someone you will prevail in the place of prayer. I say you prevail in the place of prayer. You, you are a married woman. You've done everything right. You take care of your wife. You take care of your children. Yet you are not getting the desired appreciation you ought to get. Because you have negated the spiritual dimension. Have you seen people who are so frustrated? Some of them have even died before their time. And the reason why that happened is that they wonder why they are so nice. They are good people. Yet, everything in their life seems not to be going well. That you are a good person is not a guarantee that things will go on well with you. You need to understand that life is spiritual. I tell you about that life is spiritual. Where did Moses, Aaron, and her went to? They went to the top of the hill. The top of the hill is a, is a mentor for, for a place, a man, of higher spiritual authority. A place of higher spiritual authority. There are people whose lives are out of order. There are people who work so hard and nothing is falling in place because they have not recognized the importance of climbing to the hill top. Going to a place higher than the level of the powers that are against you. You want to have breakthrough in life? You want to live a fulfilled life? You want to live a life that is orderly? You want to live a life that reveals the hand and the help of God? Go to the heat top. Now quickly, let's read verse 11. If you are sitting here, say amen. Yeah. Come on, if you are sitting there, say good amen. Yeah. Those of you in our sub branches and those of you in online, can you say good amen? Yeah. Verse 11 says, Anytime Moses had his hands in the air, the men of Israel will start winning the battle. He wasn't at the battlefront. This is awesome. This is a revelation. 
He wasn't there at the valley where they were fighting. He and Hall and Aaron were at the mountain top. But each time Moses lifted his hand up, the Israelites get victory at the battlefront. Child of God, you send your children out. You started a business. You are a father, you are a mother. You are a wife. And then your children are right there in the world. And you forgot that if you are going to see the outcome of your children's life, agrees with what the will of God is for their lives. You cannot go and sleep. You must be at the mountaintop, lifting up your prayers, lifting up your prayers for your children, lifting up your prayers for your grandchildren. There are families who have been turned upside down and the reason for that is because there is nobody at the mountaintop lifting up their hands in prayer and saying, oh God, we have done all that we know, but we are trusting you to do what we don't know and do what we cannot do we are trusting you that in this family oh god only what you have about day will come to pass we are humans that we are but we have you as our god who is the alpha and the omega we are limited as human beings but we have you as our god who is your limited god the bible said as long as Aaron and her and moses we are the mountain top with the hand of Moses lifted up, the Israelites were gaining victory. Let's now read on. But when Moses put his hands down, when Moses is no longer praying, when Moses feels that way, I think I have all the things put together, I've gotten the vessel, I've gotten everything put together, so I don't think I need prayer. And then the Amalekite, the Amalekite begins to gain advantage of the Israelite. Is it not true that most times believers don't see the need to pray in times of prosperity? The easiest trap the devil set against believers is to bring them to the place of satisfaction without a vision. The Bible told us in Joshua a thing. God spoke and said to Joshua, Joshua, you are now old. In other words, you are now satisfied. You thought you've gotten it all together. He said, open your eyes. There are still more land. Check. Before you enter school, you prayed. When you were in school, you prayed. But when you graduated, you rested. See now. What has happened to your degree? And this is one of the tricks of the devil against believers. You built one house. In your thinking, none of your mates have built their house or their houses. So in your own mind, I've arrived. And then you begin to drop your hands. You begin to drop your prayers. You begin to drop your weapon of war. You begin to drop your armor. And then you build one house. It's almost like you have done something that you shouldn't have done. Trouble left and right. Left the right center coming against you. Not because you built a house, but because after you built a house, you thought yourself, I've arrived. I can now eat, sleep, and live as I like. When the hand of Moses began to drop, then when Moses put his hand down, thinking, okay, my people are already winning, the men of Israel began to lose. Lift up your two hands. I know there are a lot of you who are part of this meeting from wherever you are. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that God will grant you grace to remain your utter prayer. Kalaba shalaba. You know, there are people who prayed for life partner. They prayed very well. They fasted. They, they, they had gone and they got married. And after they got married, they've got it what they wanted. They don't pray as they used to pray. They don't fast as they used to fast. As they used to fast. They are no longer committed as they used to be committed. Don't forget. When Moses dropped his hands, 
the Israelites began to lose. Now, we are not told to what extent the Israelites were losing. But I'm sure that the Amalekites began to kill them. Began to kill them. Said the terrible things began to happen to them. Now, let's read very quickly. Verse number 12. After some time, Moses' hands became what? Tired. Are you aware that you get to a point if you are not careful, you are tired of your spiritual commitment. You become weary. You become exhausted. You are no longer passionate as you used to be. Coming to church is like, it's a burden. When you are in that state, you know that something is already wrong. When the joy of your salvation is no longer bubbling, when you get to a point where you have excuses why you can't pray, you have reasons why you can't fast, you have reasons why you can't come to church, it is not ordinary. Something beyond what eyes can see is at work to bring you to the place of being weary so that they can travel or prevail over you. Hear what the Lord told me and I told my wife thereafter. After I left the place of prayer, he said to me, those who compromise their time of prayers for some other things will soon be consumed by that thing that they compromise prayers for. Where you don't have time to pray, whatever takes your time away from prayer will soon take your life. That is not a threat. Jesus said, watch and pray that you fall not into temptation. When the church stopped praying in the book of Acts 12, they saw what happened. James was killed. The devil was not satisfied. Took Peter. And Peter was about to go the way James went. Listen to me as a believer. You drop your hand. You drop your prayers. You drop your spiritual commitment because you think you have arrived. No problem. My people used to say, it's not the day that uh, the moment that tongues pierce your legs that it brings out meek. The devil will plant eat things in your life. You will still be thinking it's where. But he has planted them on the day of your wedding. He has planted it to, to detonate it on the day of your delivery. He has planted it on the day you will travel by land. He has planted it to detonate what he has planted in a certain day. Where you think all is well, bam, so this strategy strikes. And then you are looking at today. It was not today. It was those days, those weeks, those months. You got worried. You got carried away with the cares of, of, the, of life. You got carried away with your pleasure. That was when that seed was planted. Don't forget the Bible said, when everyone was asleep, the devil knows how to take advantage of when believers are asleep. He came, planted weed, and went away. They didn't know that weed had been planted until is plotted until it began to manifest. For some of you, there are things the enemy planted many years ago, only manifesting now. And you are trying to deal with it now. No, it was not now that it was planted. It was some time ago. Maybe at the place of your bat. Maybe at the time that you were not careful. That was where it was planted. That was the time that it. And for you to be able to deal with it, you need the help of the ancient of days. To give you the revelation into the foundation of the things you are going through. That you cannot understand. You cannot. Am I communicating here? When you slept with that boy, something was planted. Now, 13 years after you are married and you can't have a child, you can't have a child, you can't have your own children, and then you go to the hospital, they say it's an infection. The infection is as a result of that careless mistake you made some years ago. That's when the enemy penetrated and planted something in your body that has remained there and it will cause you pains all the days of your life except him who has the power to set free intervenes. And for him to intervene, you need to get to a place where you seek him with all your heart. Not this casual seeking like you are doing God favor. Somebody, today is your day of deliverance. Amen. I know we all don't need deliverance, but for someone, this service is your service. Amen. Karabash, I said this service is your service. Amen. After I gave my life to Christ, I'm going to stop somewhere this morning, or this evening rather, because I wouldn't have the time to go and complete this exhortation this morning. It was after I gave my life to Christ, God began to open my eyes. How I became alcoholic. It was after I gave my life to Christ, the Lord began to deal with me and opened my eyes to why I was sexually addicted to prostitutes. 
It was after I gave my life to Christ, the Lord began to tell me what was done to me in order for my destiny to be perverted. Listen to me. It is unwise to live your life to chance. It is unwise for you to just, the beautiful life God gave to you has become a burden. And you are not bothered. No. No. <laughs> no. The Bible says, Jabez came to a point and said, this is not the life I should be living. You know why you may be very careless, carefree, casual in your work with God, because you have not come to the place of realization. And that realization will be by revelation. You think that because Nigeria, things are hard in Nigeria, things are hard, that is why your life is hard. Even if you go to America, your life will still be hard. The only thing is that you may enjoy the economic structure that is there, but your life will still not be astounding. You will, we have designers and send us pictures, but is that all that life is? When you come to the place of realization that I can allow my life to just be drifting, I need to be sure, I need to be on a definite course, knowing where I'm going with my life, knowing that the hand of God is upon me, and I'm enjoying divine help. Someone scream this and let everybody hear you say, Heavenly Father, tonight, I ask for your hand and your help in my life. Don't say casually. I, me, I need that. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus. I need your hand and your help in my life. Twelve. You see, after some time, Moses' hand became tired. A deadly state. A deadly state. Tired. I'm confused. I don't know what to do. I don't feel like coming to church. That is the trap of the enemy. Then what happened? The Bible, so they put a large stone, a large rock rather, under Moses, under Moses for him to sit on. Let me tell you what that stone represents. The stone represents the eternal rock of ages. The stone represents the word of God. Now you see here, it had to stand or sit on the word of God as its foundation for strength. Everything may get tired. There is one thing that can never be tired. A rock cannot be tired. That is why builders use it for concrete. They use it to, for the building of a structure. So the rock they represent what cannot fail. There is one thing your life should be built upon. When you get to a point where you are tired of your life, you are tired of prayer, you are tired of fasting, you are tired of waking up to pray, you are tired of studying the Bible. Remember what the rock says. Remember the internal word of God. Fall back to the word of God. Child of God, you will not die praying. You will not die fasting. The devil will tell you the worst will happen to you. But let me tell you, when you fast and pray, it is not the worst that will happen to you. It is the best that happens. Jesus said, this kind cannot go. And said, by fasting and prayer. You are tired of coming to church. You are tired. Listen to me. When you get tired, the devil tells you, your tiredness is genuine. You have reasons to be tired. Because he knows that in that being tired, that is your time of vulnerability. But when you get tired, like all of us do experience, fall back to the rock. Fall back to the word. So the, 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 the prayer partners of Moses knew that what Moses needed this time is something they cannot offer him. It's something that will never be tired. So they supply him with the word of God. Child of God, listen to me. Blessed are you if you have uh, Aaron and Hall as a pastor. Blessed are you if you have Hall and Aaron. Not many Moses have Hall and Aaron. Many Moses will have those who will tell them, we are tried now. Uh, let's rest. But not Hall and Aaron. Quickly, please. There are steps, but I won't be able to go there because we need to rise up and pray. So after some time, Moses' arms became tired, so they put a large rock under Moses for him to sit on. Then Aaron and Hor had Moses' hands in the hair. Oh, kalabashalabo. I remember what Apostle Paul said in Ephesians 6, verse number 18. He said, pray for me. Pray for me. Child of God, I can tell you that the reason why I'm still in the faith today, the reason why I still do what I do today, is because there are some horns and arrows somewhere lifting me up in prayer. 
The reason why you are sitting here today and you think it's by your good works, it's by your power. There is a hole and error that are standing in the gap calling your name day and night, interceding for you. When Moses got tired, like uh, Peter was in prison, he couldn't pray for himself. The church lifted him up before God and God intervened. Lift up your two hands. Someone today is your day of divine revival, Amen. of spiritual revival. Amen. Your prayer life will be revived. Amen. Your revelation life will be revived. Amen. Your hunger for God will be revived. Your passion will be revived. Amen. Your zeal will be revived. Amen. Then Aaron and Hor had Moses' hands in the air. Aaron was on one side of Moses and Hor was on the other side. What were they doing? They had his hand up like this until the sun went down. They opposed him. You are tired, but we are here for you. You are tired, but we are here for you. Don't forget why all of this is going on. Joshua, one day, give me your attention, one day. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I was so tired. Really, really tired. I woke up with the, with the desire to pray. But my body tells me, please sleep on. You know how busy you were yesterday. Sleep on. And I heard this quiet voice. Someone needs your prayers right now. When I heard that. Now, for example, you say you are tired, you can't pray, you love to sleep. You love to sleep, Jesus said. The spirit is willing. The spirit is telling you pray, but the flesh is saying, relax. You know how busy you have been? Relax. That relax is dangerous. So I got up. And I was surprised that when I got up, stood, you know, I stood on my feet. And I began to pray in tongues. One hour pass. Two hours pass. And it's like I've not started. That's when I said, devil, lift up your two hands. In the name of Jesus Christ, receive the grace to obey the leading of the spirit. Oh, I shall lift up your two hands. If you don't know, you can drop your hands and, and just feel indifferent. But if you are ready, I pray that God will create in you the, the desire to obey your spirit. To obey his spirit. Are you still here? You got some few money. You got some few achievements. And you're thinking, I've arrived. So I can sleep. I see some persons, you look at their lives, you know they have not even, they are not yet on the path of destiny. They are not doing anything. Because they think that with time, things will get better. Things don't get better with time. The reason why all, Moses and Aaron will not stop praying is because there is a battle going on at the valley. They know that if they don't pray, they are going to cause casualty. Child of God, the most selfish thing you can do as a believer is a refusal to pray for others. Someone came to me and was telling me something about my family. And I said, I know it. I know it. There are three phases you must watch, for in life. watch out for in life. The beginning of what you do, the mid time of what you are doing, and the end. Those three phases are always very terrible. Some people cannot begin. Some began, they stopped halfway. Some didn't stop halfway, but they didn't finish. Lift up your two hands. I declare in the name of Jesus, I, the early season of your life, the mid-season of your life, and the closing up of your life shall be glorious. Amen. I need somebody who understood what I've just said. The early phase of your life may have been challenging. The mid phase of your life may have been very challenging. But I'm declaring this in the name of Jesus, you will end well. Amen. You will end triumphantly. You will prevail in the name of Jesus. You will triumph in the name of Jesus. Oh, your life will not be miserable. Your life will not be a mockery. Your life will not be a mess. Are you still there? If Moses, Hall and Aaron have decided to sit down and just, child of God, your husband said I'm going for an interview. Your child said I'm going, I'm writing an exam that day. Your wife said there is something going on in my office. You be the whore. You be the Aaron. You be the Moses. There should be people you can call and say, please join me. Let's do some three days prayer together. 
There should be people you can call to. The Bible said when there was an issue that was threatening the life of the three Hebrew boys, including Daniel in Babylon, the king had said, if no one can tell me what I dreamt in the meaning of the dream, everyone will be killed. The Bible said when Daniel was called upon, Daniel told the king, he said, just give me some few days. I will come with a solution. What did he do? He went to his brethren. That is why my brothers and sisters, I have not told you not to join someone who is not her or Aaron or Moses to pray. Because if you do, what you will get, you will like it. They will pray. But it will not be a prevailing prayer. Daniel went to Shedan, Mishan, and Abednego and told them, this is what we have at hand. The scripture said, and they began to pray. And that night, prevailing prayers, that night, God revealed to them what the king dreamt and the meaning of the dream. And the Bible said, and they rejoiced. The next day, it was not three of them or four of them that went to the king. Child of God, you know what? Your victory is our victory. My victory is our victory. Are you still here? The victory of Peter over the plot of Herod was a church victory. Oh, when are the, when, when, where are those days when the church lift up their voice to pray for a sister sick in the hospital? Today, if I raise a prayer for a sister who has breast cancer now, instead of people praying, they will go and carry it and share it on Facebook and share it on, uh, on, uh, on whatever. Can I, can I church members? But when you have people who are spirit filled, when they hear that something is happening to a brother, to a sister, they carry it with a burden and they go before God, not spreading the news with the intent to mock the person and mock God. Where are those spiritually inclined, spiritually intelligent believers? Where are they? I remember when I joined the Christian faith. Prayers will be going on day and night for the sake of a child that is ill. Day and night, the church will be praying for a child. And then the answer comes. Everybody is rejoicing. Everybody is celebrating. Today, it is me, 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 me. Horn, Aaron, and Moses would have said, we are not at the battlefield. Whatever happens to Joshua, that is his business. But they are aware that the defeat of one is the defeat of all. When you are a selfish believer, you can't pray. The only time you pray is when it concerns you. You. And you see how you are not getting answers. Because it's about you, you. Jesus was deliberate when he said, give us this day. Not give me. The most powerful prayer that mature believers pray is a prayer of intersection. I've told you this over and over again. I can't remember when I have to spend one hour praying for myself. Even when my head is challenged. Even when my business is challenged, I can't remember. Father, my business. I can't remember. I don't even know how to pray for myself. I used to hear. I used to hear. Verse number 30, which is the last verse. Because Aaron, Hall, and Moses were at the mountain top, at the heat top, lifting up their hands and crying to God. Let me show this to you. The Lord said to me, the hand of Moses lifted up is a symbol to draw God's attention to we need your hand, oh God. Someone shout this and let everyone hear you all over the world. Say, oh God. Oh, God. oh there are those who are very, very, you know, you are very intelligent. You really don't make noise. You just say, oh God. But I need you to scream it like Jesus did by the grave of Lazarus. Say, Lazarus, come for. Say, oh God. oh God. I need your hand. And your help in my life. Shout to let your neighbors hear that you said this. Say, oh God, I need your hand and your help in my life to do for me what I can do for myself. The Bible said when Daniel began to assay, began to assay in the land of the ungodly people, in the land of people who hated him, the people began to investigate what is the secret of this man. Why is he so astounding? And the Bible said, they now came together as a group and said, we must find the secret of Daniel. Why he keep excelling? Why he keep prevailing? Why, why he's exceptional? 
and the Bible said they went as a group. Daniel says verse not by level. They went as a group. And when they went to investigate, they saw that it's one thing that Daniel has always done consistently. Always praying and asking God for help. Shout this because we are about to rise up today. Because I see somewhere you will prevail. Yeah. Say Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I, need I need your help. In every area of my life. I need your help in my family. I need your help in my head. I need your help in my career. Are you still here? Check it. Check it. Check it. When you get to a point where you now say I'm a minister, you are now rolling with a pastor. <laughs> you are now being greeted. Everybody greet you. Good morning, sir. Because in their thinking, they assume you are very spiritual. If you are not careful, you will think you have arrived. Watch it. In every church, the people that grow the most, except those who are intelligent, are those who don't have titles. So those who don't have titles, they know they are not entitled to anything, so they have to crawl to God. But for some of us who have titles, we think because of our titles, we are entitled to everything. Even if we don't do anything, it's our entitlement for God to bless us. It's our entitlement for God to heal us. You lie. That's why your life is not a testimony. That's why your life is not changing levels. That's why you are struggling. That's why you are not experiencing God the way you should be. If God open your eyes and show you where you should have been, you will cry. You are more interested in being an usher than being a fire. You are more interested in singing than experiencing God. You are more interested in climbing the pupil to scream and shout than your life being a living testimony, your, than your life being on fire. There are two dimensions of being of experiencing the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is a level that the Holy Spirit possesses you. There is a level where you possess the Holy Spirit. The first one is the Holy Spirit possesses you. The higher, uh, the first part is when you possess the Holy Spirit. The higher dimension is where the Holy Spirit possesses you. At that point, you are no longer in control. He tells you what to do. You behave in an abnormal way. You act in an abnormal way. You do abnormal things. You give in an abnormal way. You pray in an abnormal way. You fast in an abnormal way because you are no longer in charge. Too many Christians are too ordinary. Year in, year out. Cold, lukewarm, sick, tired, not on fire, don't know what to do with their lives. Lift up your tongue and scream that again. It's our major prayer. Say, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. I need your hand. I need your hand. And I need your help. I need your help. In, my in my life. Shout and say, oh God. oh God. I need your hand upon my life. I and I need your help. I need in every area of my life. In the name of Jesus Christ. If you shouted, that shout a good amen like you are the only one here. The next order, 17 verse number 13 in closing. So Joshua, come on, read this. This is very exciting. What they say? So Joshua and his men defeated the Amalekites in this battle. Is it because they were best fighters? Is it because they were very skillful? Because they were men at the heat top. <laughs> that is why as a member of this church, whatever the outcome of your life is, don't ascribe the glory to yourself. Somebody is praying for you every day. When you get to the bishop house very early in the morning, you are asked to wait because he's praying. There is Joshua Hall and Moses at the mountain top praying for you. That is why wise believers, this is what they do. When they experience victory, they give God glory and they appreciate the grace that they are under. They give God glory and they recognize that there is a grace that is working for me. I am under a grace that is speaking for me. But proud ones will say, well, I fasted and prayed. Joshua would have said, you know, the way we're fighting, we are trained expert. No. You know, when I went to school, I saw it very well. I read very well. Have you not heard? I told my children we're having money devotion. I told them. There are three reasons why you can't do without God. You need his protection. You need his direction. You need his provision. I told them. Now you are in school. Never you think that because you went to school, your life will go well. You need more than school. He said, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
Don't chest that and say, yeah, I came out with the best grade. There are people that came out with the best grade. They have been in the hospital for six years. They no longer need the grade. They don't even know where the good grade is. Except the Lord built the house. The laborer that built it, built in vain. I admonish them. I said, there's something me and mommy can't do for you. That only God can do. Don't sit down there and the Bible said, so, so. The one so means consequently as a result of what both parties were doing. The one fighting with the sword and the one fighting with the word. The, those fighting at the valley, throwing their arrows. And those who didn't have arrows about, but they have the spiritual weapon of faith. And they were crying at the mountaintop. So Joshua and the armies of Israel came out victoriously. Why? Because there were men at the mountaintop. You can't pray for your husband. So quarrel with him. I don't know kind of man married. Child of God, listen to me. Until you get to the mountaintop, your victory is not guaranteed. Because you know what? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness in high places. In our next service, we are going to be saying what prevailing prayers is. Prevailing prayers. The secret to prevailing prayers. To prevail means to conquer, to triumph, to overcome, to win. You will win. I say you will win. Amen. I say you will win. Amen. The most effective way to pray prevailing prayers is to lay hold on the word of God and take the word of God as your authority and confront that situation. He said, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And the Bible says, and the word of God grew and prevailed. There is nothing that can stand against the word of God. When you take the word of God, I am a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Whatever is resisting my destiny, whatever is resisting the manifestation of my greatness, hear the word of God. I am dead in Christ and I've resurrected to a new life. The one that lives in me now is greater than the one that lives in the world. I cannot be stopped because I am, oh come, are you still here? I am more than a conqueror. And you approach life nothing can stop you from prevailing. Stand to your feet. Lay your two hands on your head first and foremost. The way some of you are